We're going to talk about some trauma scenarios here for the, for the rest of the evening. First of all, Dr. Gosser and all you all, thank you very much for the invitation back and for your attention. We're going to talk about some basic principles of fracture management. The whole purpose of this talk is to help you communicate with us so we can manage our patients better. Uh, you know, there's a certain language we use uh, from the weight-bearing restrictions to the description of fractures, but it's really not that hard. Uh, for example, we're going to talk a little bit about some patterns of fractures. So just looking quickly at this, how would you describe this pattern? Does it look like a spiral pattern, transverse, or what fracture? Maybe you don't see it. So let's put on a third grade thinking hats. Literally, it's that simple. So we call this a spiral fracture. I want to go a little bit further. This is a transverse fracture. Yes, if I had crayons, my talk would be made out of crayons. But it's, it is a little bit more intelligent than that. This is a comminuted fracture of the lower tibia. So first thing we ask is just communication. So the ER doctors are calling us and saying, okay, we have a closed fracture or we have an open fracture and then a V bone and then some description. This is a shaft fracture of the femur and then there's this. So what is this? Is this a radial shaft fracture? Is this a fracture of the proximal humerus? Or is this a fracture of the distal radius? It's a location, right? So yes, distal radius, it's that simple. Why does this matter though? Because if you take the fracture pattern and you add that with the bone quality, the host, the mechanism of injury, well then that directs our treatment as to what we're gonna do for that patient. Because then what we do directs the weight bearing status, directs the, what the rehabilitation specialist can and cannot do for us. And all that matters because that affects the patient's long-term outcomes and that's really what it's all about, all right? So we've figured out what the fracture looks like. Now we're gonna go ahead and stabilize the fracture. This is where the real science comes in. This two ways bone heals. If you put the two edges of bone together and you can hold them and you can squeeze them together, the bones communicate, they have cutting cones and you can actually recreate where the bone forms and heals very similar to the contour and shape of it was prior to the injury, often. You know, when you put two pieces of tile together, there's always a little bit of grout. Well, there's always a little bit of that, but with primary bone healing, it limits that the most. This is important because articular injuries, you don't want your joints to be anything except smooth. And it's very rigid fixation, which allows for that. For example, this distal tibia we saw earlier, you want this anatomic and you want the cartilage to be preserved, so it undergoes fixation, primary bone healing, and hopefully the patient goes on without any long-term arthritis. Secondary bone healing. This is a little different. Uh, this is a lot of casting. This is a lot of rods. You're not trying to worry so much about all the little pieces. You want the overall alignment. This is something that we do along with shaft fractures. It's still very important. It's still, it's probably equally as common as the other methods. The fixation is not as stiff. The bone that has fractured has leaked some bone marrow. That bone marrow becomes a callus and that's a secondary way of bone healing. That's a rod, so you see it all the time. So you can see that big oval area. That's all callus, but that's not in the joint. This patient's gonna do fine. He or she will never see that, will never know, the patient will be great. Now, intraarticular fractures, we kind of touched upon it. The reason this is so critical, imagine walking around uh, in your shoe with a pebble in it. it. Doesn't feel too good. Imagine having that in your joint. That's destined for pain and long-term complications. So you want these little pieces all together. You want them to heal without any ridges. You don't want any step-offs, right? And you want everything nice and smooth. So you put the pieces back together and you get primary bone healing. And that's why we use plates and screws. Like any good marriage, if you have two people working together and both bearing the load or sharing the load, things usually end up being fine. But if a uh, like a husband, for example, ends up having to be a load-bearing implant. The problem with it is, is that he can eventually fail. And so it's better to have a balance of uh, equality. Uh, this is a fracture of the proximal tibia. You can see all the little pieces here. We put this back together. Plates, screws, primary bone healing. We want everything to heal anatomic. And so you're going to let this patient that we just reconstructed all these little pieces with immediately weight bear? Yes or no? Probably not, because you want to protect the cartilage. Because the problem is if you don't and you have failures, that's a problem, post-traumatic arthritis. And so you have to limit weight bearing, you have to have good fixation. And then there's certain things you just can't control like the host. 
This is an example of an intraarticular fracture and a shaft, distal femur and the femoral shaft. The articular injury is stabilized with primary bone healing and the shaft is stabilized with secondary bone healing. Acetabular fractures, again, pretty common. Same thing, you want all these pieces back together so you have limited risk of arthritis. This radius fracture we saw earlier, same thing. ORIF, plates, screws, primary bone healing, limited weight bearing, early range of motion. Long bone fractures. So now we're getting into the other more meat and potatoes of orthopedics. You know, just put a nail in it, get it done, get the patient out of bed. The goal is a little different here. It's not so much are they going to limit arthritis in three months. I want this patient mobilized the, night, the next day, maybe even the same day. What are the long bones, the humerus, femur, and the tibia? We'll talk about femur fractures. Probably the second most common after tibia fractures in terms of long bone injuries. These numbers are going up every year. We see it all the time. High energy, long bone, strong bone. It's not ground level falls. That's a hip fracture. That's a whole different host, right? These are motorcycle accidents, fall for construction scaffoldings, et cetera. Initially, the patient comes in, they're stabilized temporarily in some sort of splint or traction. And as soon as the patient is optimized, we're not waiting for them to be in the best shape ever, but as long as they can get to the OR safely, you want to make sure chest trauma is not a complication, make sure the other injuries you're not missing. And the patient's shaft fractures, again, are going to be stabilized, like we talked about earlier, a secondary bone healing. You want it out the length, you want rotation, you want it stable, you want a load sharing implant, something that's going to be able to get you up and moving. This is an example of a femoral shaft fracture. You can approach it integrate. You can come at it from the knee. This is coming from the knee. There's an incision. There's a starting pin to make sure we're right where we want to be. We use a reamer to size the canal and get some of the uh, medullary contents out of the way as we pressurize with this rod. And you get a retrograde femoral nail locked in place, immediate weight bearing. Tibia fractures are the most common long bones. This number is above half a million now yearly. The thing with tibia fractures, and same thing with femur, but more common tibias, there's a lot of associated injuries. So anytime you get x-rays of any type of fracture, you always want to have x-rays of the joint above and below so we don't miss anything because missed injuries are very common. And again, not every fracture needs surgery. You can treat it non-operatively. We have parameters, common sense, like if you're within a few degrees of angulation, if you're within a few degrees of translation, you don't really want any type of shortening. You can put it in a cast. The problem is six weeks, eight weeks of a long leg cast, non-weight bearing. Not ideal, but if you're going to avoid surgery, sometimes I guess it's beneficial. But what are our surgical options where we can nail things, we can plate things, we can X-fix things, combination. Since we're talking about nails, let's talk about nails. The beauty of a nail is immediate weight bearing, the less malunion, this earlier weight bearing and earlier motion. So summary of long bones, any, you know, injury can occur at any level. Uh, the key things with long bone fractures is if we can nail it, we can get you up out of bed faster. Thank you.